Now, back to the show on 77 WABC. That's right. I am Amelia, and I'm broadcasting live from WABC Studios in New York City and streaming live on iHeartRadio.com and Amelia.com worldwide. Well, it's restaurant week here in New York City. It's one of my favorite weeks. I can't wait. And to help us understand more about the restaurant and hospitality business, I asked Jonathan Siegel to join me. He is the CEO of The One Group, a publicly held food and beverage hospitality service business that develops and operates upscale, high-energy restaurants and lounges. This includes SDK, a trendy steakhouse that caters to women, and seven locations are known to be breaking down the stodginess of the normal old steakhouse and losing that masculine feel and vibe and bringing some trend and fun. Simply put, SDK is not your daddy's steakhouse. It's somewhere you're going to find me. Jonathan it has over 38 years of experience working with family-owned hospitality company, and he's proudly the 2013 Ernest & Young Entrepreneur of the Year for New York Region. So please help me Welcome, Jonathan Siegel. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you for being here. It's great to be here. I was listening to your introduction. I thought you know so much about the restaurant business, I might as well not be here. <laughs> oh, no. You, you <laughs> clearly have mastered. I had to learn the hard way. Um, and it just was, you know, I think like so many people, I mean, we work with a lot of athletes who always go, I want to open a restaurant. And the concept and the theory is true. You want to. You so love You see what happens. But I think people really forget how hard it truly is. And the restaurant industry, unfortunately, has the highest failure rate. It does, yeah. I mean, you just, no, no quicker do they open, do they close. And there is, I always, I mean, that's what I was saying in the opening, is it is truly an art form to, to really learn how to do it and to do something that's uh, memorable enough to bring people to come actually come back. So first of all, tell us a little bit about the one group. So uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, we're a global hospitality company. Uh, we have two principal divisions, our restaurant division, uh, where our principal brand is uh, SDK. Uh, and then we have our hospitality division, where it's a fairly unique part of our business, and it's where we operate a, a lot of other restaurants. We'll go into hotels, casinos, and we'll do their entire food and beverage program. So we'll do everything within those facilities, from room service to mini bars. We'll operate the pools, the roofs, all the restaurants. Uh, and within that, we have a much broader range of restaurants, but we don't actually consider those restaurants as our brands. Those are restaurants that we actually create for the facilities in which we operate. Which is all the hard part, actually. They can and then hire the experts. It, uh, to some degree, yes. If you look at the average hotels that we'll operate in, on our hotel that employs about 300 people, normally about 250 of those people will actually be answerable to our company. Uh, pretty much the only thing we don't do in these hotels is sell the rooms, check the people in, clean the rooms, and do concierge services. Everything else is is the one group that's doing that operation, and we'll do it under the under the name of the flag. So we kind of disappear into the background, uh, uh, operating those parts of the business, which, as you've mentioned, are pretty hard parts to operate. Oh, they're very hard for hard. So I keep reading that STK is focused on women. What does that actually mean? It's a great question, and I, I'm asked it a lot. It was in 2006 when we opened uh, our first STK. I was coming back from the SLA uh, in Harlem. And I uh, secured the space in the meatpacking district on uh, Little West 12th. And my uh, liquor attorney said to me, well, what are you going to put there? And I said, well, I haven't actually worked it out, but the, <laughs> the space is great. The meatpacking district I know is going to explode, so I'm just going to get it, and I'll worry about it later. He said, well, it's later. <laughs> so you really need to decide now. now. <laughs> so he said to me, why don't you open a steakhouse? And I said, well, steakhouse, meatpacking, that's good. But the trouble with steakhouses is uh, one of the oldest restaurants in America, but it's probably the most unchanged. We used to joke that the only difference is, is the walls have got woodier, the red wine's got redder, and the portions have got bigger. And the traditional steakhouse is about 60, about 70% men to women. So we thought maybe we can change the paradigm. Maybe we can create something where we take the business tie out and put the girl in, where we take the business chatter out and put music in. So we took everything that we understood about uh, hospitality and restaurants and vibe restaurants, vibe dining, uh, and we created SDK. We made it female-friendly or appeal to female sensibility in the design, in the menu, in the layout, by making it a much more social environment. On the menu, everything came in, comes in small, medium, and large. Uh, there's a bigger selection of dishes, not just steaks, a large selection of salads and, and different appetizers. For example, we won't have crab cakes. We have crab salad. So we're all catering to a menu which really appeals to a broader demographic. Built round a bar, great music, great vibe. It's a natural place for girls to come and for guys to follow. Yeah, so for, and for me, because I am one of your customers, and we um, thank you for that, um, is the fact that I feel completely comfortable going there by myself because 
I mean, I can't tell you, not not, not as the day gets to the middle of the war, the bartenders are incredibly friendly and welcoming. And I like that I can order a small portion. Because yeah. if not, you're taking really two-thirds of a steak home, which is such a waste because I don't want cold steak anyway. So I like the customer that I can feel like you actually know me. But the friendliness and the music is off the charts. The music's a, a big key to us. We have DJs at all our restaurants. And the reason we have DJs is not because we're a club or because we play the music loud, although I have to be honest, we're probably, as the night progresses, a little bit louder than your average restaurant. But we, we, we have a DJ because he'll read the room. And I was really interested in your preamble when you spoke about uh, the experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we'll, you can have an amazing meal in a restaurant, but if the environment or the atmosphere is wrong or the music's too loud or there's something else, it doesn't matter how good your meal is, you're left with that resigning memory of a bad experience because you weren't happy with the venue. We have DJs because most venues will play their music from a iPod or from a computer and they're locked into a playlist. Our DJs will read the room. Once they, they find a music or a genre or a beat or a rhythm that engages the consumer, two things happen. The room becomes more sociable because we're all dancing and bopping in our seats to the music that we know and we like, and the vibe and energy increase in the room. As the vibe and energy increases in the room, two things happen thereafter. People eat faster and they drink more. <laughs> they do. And you're sitting, the way the, the lounge area is set up, it's for like social sitting. It's so you exactly automatically right. get to know your neighbor the way it's the way it's set up. You can't go in and not know anybody because you'll know 10 people when you leave. And you bump into them. And the, the original designer was Lionel O'Hayan from iCrave and uh, he brought into uh, the dining, into SDK, the first SDK, the same experience that we have in uh, nightclubs or lounges where everything's lower, everything's uh, like these areas where you co-mingle. Yep. And if you look at a, a, an SDK setup, e- even on the carpet areas, they're like these dining areas where six ta- or four tables really interact with each other. Everything's a little bit lower. So I can actually lead back and bump into the girl behind me, turn around to apologize, and I've broken the ice. You know, all of a sudden I've started a conversation and I'm in. And once I can start that conversation, that's part of the problem that we have in the social environment. We're all kind of maybe a little bit nervous to start the conversation. But we always go back to places we meet people. Yes, And I absolutely. remember that from growing up. So by creating these environments where people meet people and they're much more sociable, it adds to repeat business for us. No, I think it's brilliant. So my question is, when you're building a big chain, um, how... How do you keep each location either the same or more customized for the, the neighborhood? Is it different? Is it the same? Clearly, I did it wrong. We, so <laughs> you, have to, you have to stay. The most important thing is to stay true to what you do. But what you can't do is take a working process in one state or one city and move that in its entirety to another. This is where there's a lot of great restaurants that try and expand nationally or even internationally, and they actually fail. Within SDK, they're all designed very similar. They are built round bars, but there's certain aspects that will change from city to city, particularly in America. I always joke that America is not a country of 50 states. America is a country of 50 countries because the way we operate and the way we live and the way we interact in New York is completely different to Los Angeles. It's different to Miami. So what you need to do is really adapt certain aspects of your working process to suit the community that you're actually operating in. If you just pick up a New York style restaurant and plomp it in Los Angeles or plomp it in Miami, you will not be successful. You have to respect the community and adapt your processes to suit to suit their their customers. That's their probably ways. why so many of them do fail. Absolutely. Um, so when you talk about you know you know eating and eating bright and and some you know some really focus just on the food but not the experience, is is that like is that your signature? I mean, is that what you're known for combining these two elements together so beautifully? It's it's, it's the most important thing. I've I've gone out on uh, a lot of times so, and had an amazing meal, uh, but the atmosphere in the room has been bad. But this, the reverse has happened as well. I've gone out and I've had an a, an average meal in an amazing room, and I've had a fantastic experience. And I've gone away, and I knew I would go back. You know, the science today behind home prepared foods is so good. I can invite you to my home and I'll make you a boil in the bag meal and it'll be pretty damn good. So, you know, we don't just go out to eat solely for the purpose of of eating. We go out more because we want to enjoy an all-encompassing experience. And that really is an overriding difference in my mind also between success and failure. Awesome. So we're going we're gonna to take a couple of calls before we go to break. We're taking a call from Joe. Joe's calling in from Staten Island. Joe, welcome to the show. Hey, how you guys doing? We're doing great. How are you? 
I'm good. I'm good. Um, I, I, uh, before my question, I just want to uh, ask you guys, uh, do you realize that this is a segregated all? Whoops, we lost you. Uh, goodbye. There we, go. we love technology. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So we are going to take a quick break and we're going to fix our little technical problem. And we'll be back in just a moment uh, taking some of your calls at 1-800-848-WABC, 1-800-848-9222, because it's Saturday and we want to talk to you. I'm Amelia on 77 WABC. If you have a mortgage rate that is higher than 2.75% and an APR of 2.99%, then please pay close attention. And I urge you to call one 800 700 80 right now to get the very low 10-year fixed rate of 2.75% with an APR of 2.99%. When you call 1-800-700-8068, a mortgage specialist at Network Capital Funding Corporation will let you know exactly how much money you can be saving within minutes. Yep, the call only takes a few minutes. And this low fixed 2.75% with an APR of 2.99% is only for you, the WABC listeners, from our friends at Network Capital. Okay, so I know you're asking yourself, how can they offer such a low rate? Well, that's because they are a direct lender. It is their own money that they're lending you. So make the call now, 1-800-700-8068, for the very low fixed 10-year rate of 2.75% with an APR of 2.99%. That's 1-800-700-8068. Again, that's 1-800-700-8068. Tell them Amelia sent you. She's not here to change your mind, but she will get you to think for yourself. Call Amelia now at 1-800-848-WABC. Yes, I am Amelia, and I'm broadcasting live from WABC Studios in New York City and streaming live now on iHeartRadio.com and Amelia.com. Well, it's Restaurant Week here in New York City, and to help us understand more about restaurants and hospitality business, I asked Jonathan Siegel to join me. He's the CEO of The One Group, a food and beverage hospitality service business that develops and operates upscale, high-energy restaurants and lounges, and he's proudly the 2013 Ernest & Young Entrepreneur of the Year for New York City. Well, for some of you who've been out there taking a look at the media, there has been a lot of talk over a post on Craigslist last week about restaurant behavior. And someone was complaining about it is taking so much longer to turn the tables these days. So the people in the restaurant of New York City started an interesting investigation and they began comparing camera footage from 2004 with recent experiences customers were having in 2014. Apparently, technology has changed more than just the new digital security cameras because in 20. 2014, the average time patrons spent in a restaurant was just a little bit over an hour. And as soon as the table was uh, was filled, waiters brought their menus. Eight minutes later, the food was out and ordered. And once again, and then about five minutes, they were end up paying the bill. Fast forward 10 years later, everything is different. Now a customer is seated, given menus, and they take the order, take out their phones. Some ask people for uh, a Wi-Fi connection for the restaurant. Other people are looking up things on Yelp. Other people are asking people to take photographs. Well, it's 21 minutes after sitting down that the average person actually orders the food. And when the food arrives at the table, well, now we have a habit of taking photo shoots now. Everybody does little foodies taking pictures. And even after all the picture taking, so many people now ask the waiters to take the food back because it's cold. 20% of the people who were asked to take the food back for reheating after the photo shoot and after the meal it now takes 20 minutes to even ask for the check and another 20 minutes to actually pay and be free from the table that total what is the total time now in 2014 well the total time went from one hour to one hour and 55 minutes almost double is what has happened in this decade our phones might be fun and they might be entertaining but do they actually cross the line and become rude Hmm. We want to ask you, what about those bad restaurant behaviors? Call us 1-800-848-WEC, 1-800-848-9222, because we want to hear from you. So have you seen behavior change over the last decade? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's funny because in uh, earlier this year, we did a video of SDK in London, and we sent a random uh, crew in on a, on, it was actually the Saturday uh, just before New Year's Eve, so it's not a great time to do the video. And uh, I read this article, and I suddenly th- thought of that video, and I went back and I looked at the video, and every other table 
throughout that whole video, there are people on their phones taking the pictures, pictures taking pictures, they actually have other taking pictures of their drinks. Now, in our right, particular and restaurants, yep. absolutely. Uh, we're kind of and not overly hung no up about it because we're just selling the drinks. Uh, right. Uh, right. We interact you know, there's some uh, way more between ourselves than there is on food. The restaurant has uh, but it's definitely changed. had an impact and on restaurants. And it definitely does and I think take, continue to have an impact on restaurants. Bit longer. And of course, then uh, the consumer sits back as the article went on to say to feel that they're not getting necessarily good service when in fact, really, their whole expectation of service needs to change because of the way they're now interacting between themselves in a restaurant. Yeah, and you know, I, you know, I was talking a little bit, you know, just from my own experience, how timing is so critical. And I didn't have any of the, the battles with the technology that is now. So because the time is now being controlled more by the technology and the, and the customer, the patron, how does that change the bottom line for the restaurant? Because you still have to turn so many tables, right? You're, you're still trying to do a mathematical equation and it's out of your control, it sounds it, like. It definitely has an impact. There's certainly ways and professional uh, restaurateurs that understand these issues know how to speed up service at a table without, without, uh, without making the guests feel uncomfortable or unwelcome. Uh, but you're right, technology is such that, you know, we can track from the moment the food is put in the computer to when it's fired in the kitchen to when it's brought out to when it's served. So, you know, often uh, people will also have a misperception of timing. They'll sit there and say, do you know, I've been waiting 20 minutes for my uh, entree when in fact we know for a for fact, fact yep. they've been waiting 12 minutes and 12 minutes when you're hungry can feel like 20 minutes so technology is there really to uh, keep us alert to what we're doing but it doesn't necessarily provide us with a solution because the truth of the matter is if the client is dis is dissatisfied because they felt they've been waiting too long then maybe you know we have to address that for what it is and not for or for the way they perceive it rather than for what it actually was just makes the restaurant business even more challenging just add it add it to the <laughs> list of difficulties so we're going to take a call arthur arthur is calling in from queens arthur Welcome to the show. Hello. Hi. How are you? Hi. How are, I, this is a really great show. I, I wish you were on every day. <laughs> well, I think you need to put that request in somewhere. <laughs> how are you, I, Arthur? I'm good. Uh, I, I have a question for the steakhouse guy. Yes. Hello. He's Hello listening. there. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. Do you how serve? are you? I understand that the uh, we're an open restaurant and everybody's welcome. Absolutely, and it's such a fun atmosphere. Let's take another call. Felix. Felix is calling in from Riverdale. Felix, mood today. Um, I, we're just going to clear the board, and we'll be taking calls from 1-800-848-WABC, 1-800-848-9222, because we're talking about restaurant behavior and restaurants here, because it's restaurant here, here in New York City, um, and we want to hear from you, because definitely we all have a little bit too sense when it comes to our restaurant behavior. So when you're talking about, um, we're talking about the, the, you know, the, the art form of actually creating a, a successful restaurant is it different internationally than it is here? Do you have do you have more fun? I mean, Americans, right? I always think more fun over there than it is here. Uh, or do you still enjoy the uh, the interestingness we, of America? When we opened our first SDK, we didn't know whether or not it would uh, move nationally until we opened our second and third. Uh, but then we had to work out where we could go first internationally. So we thought, what better place to go than than London? I'm obviously British. And the English are kind of pretty boring sometimes. We're very conservative. And so we thought if SDK... Although London's a fun city. London, London is a, fun is a very city, fun city. When, when it comes to our dining, we're pretty traditional. Yeah. Uh, and we were just interested to see that if the SDK concept would go over over in, in England. Uh, and we felt fairly confident that if it was successful in a conservative dining environment, which the United Kingdom is then we could probably take the, the, the concept anywhere. And what's interesting is in London, uh, everybody gets way more engaged than they even do here in America. Oh, no, London is, I'm telling you, is a fun city. <laughs> so, so we were really confident with that. But the same principle applies nationally as it applies internationally. We'll keep the generality of the way we operate, of, of what we develop the same, but we'll change it for Italy or we'll change it for London so that it fits and works within the community because it doesn't matter if you're national or you're international. If you don't embrace the local community, then you're going to have a pretty hard job of succeeding. Did you have any um, any concerns about taking kind of like an an old concept that's been around for such a long time? I mean, when you say the word steakhouse, we all immediately come to the same pictures. Did you have any nervousness? I mean, it's a fascinating idea, but going, will it actually pull off? Uh, n n not doing it here in America, uh, to be honest, because I think America embraces change. 
And we have some of the greatest quick change artists in the world, Madonna. Look how many times has Madonna reinvented herself. And right. We embrace her every time she does it. So the fact that we were able to come in and uh, re-change the paradigm uh, successfully uh, was because America, I believe, embraces change. I think that's part of the thing that makes this country such a strong country, the fact that it doesn't stay stuck in the mud but continually is progressive in everything that it does, both socially, uh, technologically, uh, and the way we interact in general. So, I mean, and, and you've been in this for such a long time now. I mean, is there still things about the restaurant industry that just surprise you that you yeah, just go I learn, it, I learn every day. And I learned from that Craigslist posting, you know, without even thinking about it. This is some smart, whether or not they did find a tape from 2004, uh, you know, is irrelevant. The truth is that what they did write about or whoever wrote about it is accurate. So every day you're learning something new. And, and, and the most important thing is never to believe your own story in anything that you do. You've always got to remain fresh and try and just change everything up to the extent that it doesn't become old or stale. We're going to be taking your calls at 1-800-848-WABC, 1-800-848-9222, because we want to hear about you. Um, so you know, I definitely have said for myself, I've definitely seen over the last decade how much behavior has changed in restaurants. Um, I'm also European. So again, for us, we were always dressed when we went out. Um, and we had, you know, a lot of the very conservative behaviors around the tables, even with kids and just etiquette. And now you've seen the things have absolutely gotten so much more casual, especially when it comes to the phone, uh, to dress code. And it seems that more control now is on the patron side about the atmosphere in the feel, um, which I found is huge, just such a hard struggle in the restaurant business to keep what I wanted to create a reality. Right. Um, and so now with even more freedoms, um, I mean, it's just really, you guys have done such a brilliant job by bringing like the right type of people together. Um, I noticed for myself, because again, I'm, I'm always out for dinner out in the areas with clients, is how many women are there and how comfortable it is. Um, I love the, the, what you were talking about, that you set the dynamic up so that you can accidentally bump into somebody else to start the conversation. So there's so much thinking that went into this. But statistically, still, restaurants fail over and over and over again. Um, even some of the most nostalgic restaurants we hear now are just closing up shop because they can't make ends meet. So, and everybody wants to go into the restaurant business. So, what is it that you would say to somebody when they're talking about having a concept and actually executing it that they really have to dial down into? I mean, is it, it that thinking of the floor plan? I don't think anybody thinks about when they think, oh, my gosh, I want to go into the restaurant business. And yet it's so critical because it changes the experience. I think that the most important thing is to stay in control of what's going on in the room. We, we are much uh, uh, as interested, not much more, as interested in looking at the restaurant from 50,000 feet as we are from looking at six feet off the table. So uh, we, we try. nothing happens in any of our restaurants by accident. Everything happens for a reason or a purpose. Uh, when we seat the restaurant, we'll seat the restaurant in a such a way so there's a balance in the room. It's not a case to just seat somebody at the first available table. You want to bring the energy in the, in the room up all at one go. But the thing that, that I would say if you to turn around to people is that once you develop a, a concept or an idea, make sure you stay true to it. So and do you have to hire different kinds of people then? Because you're really thinking on your feet in real time. You are. You are the, the, the type of uh, waiter or waitress that would work that would work successfully at an STK is not necessarily the type of waitress that would work at a at a Thomas Keller restaurant or at a Danny Meyer restaurant because our our, our staff are much more engaged in in the process. Uh, and this is all part and parcel of what we do to stay in control of what's going on in the room. And if we're in control of what's going on in the room uh, and embracing the, the guest experience alongside or with them, uh, then we're going to be in, then we're, we're going to keep a balanced, successful room going. And that is what the, the overriding uh, memory that will stay with people when they leave. So, what's your favorite memory from in the kitchen? Running like through it as fast as I can. <laughs> I'm absolutely terrified of kitchens. I have no clue how they do what they do. Everybody's shouting at everybody, and the food comes out, and I just think it's like a magical land of mystery. Yeah, it's my favorite part to go see is the kitchen because it's just wild I'm, back there. Amelia, I'm terrified. Te Run through them as fast <laughs> as I can. So you don't have any Anthony Bordeaux moments that you go, oh, my gosh. No, I but I tell even. you what I do often comment on because I, I, I start every now and again to watch like Gordon Ramsay on Hell's Kitchen and all of these things. And the truth is none of that happens in a kitchen. 
I mean, it just all this craziness that you see on these shows, it just does not happen in a kitchen. Uh, kitchens are much more organized. They're pretty dangerous places. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and you've it's, got, in your, you have no room. No, you have you're, no room. you're dealing with fire and sharp knives and sharp objects. And the last thing you need is sharp wit as well. <laughs> so uh, uh, so the truth is really what we see on, the, on these shows is really entertainment, but not the reality of what goes on in a kitchen. Because really, the only way a kitchen can be successful is if everybody really does pull as a team. You know, that is one situation where any one station can let down an entire night. So the kitchen really has to work as a team. And if you work as a team, you have to be completely respectful of everything everybody does in that kitchen, whether it's washing the dishes or whether it's uh, flaming the uh, creme brulee or grilling the steak. You know, and, and so I, you know, I attract a lot of people who are, are entrepreneurs and they would say, you know, what, what can I do to try to, you know, harness my skills? I say it's the skills of the expediter. I'm like, if you show me the expediter in your business, I can tell you whether you're making money. Most chefs don't even cook. <laughs> Most chefs in the restaurant, they're not there cooking. They're on the back line expediting and they'll only jump on the line if they, if they run into difficulty or run behind. Um, but the expediter is the, the key person in that kitchen. He's the, the sergeant major that'll get everybody marching to the same tune. So with being at Restaurant Week, you know, what is it that people can do to actually go out and experience Restaurant Week? Because it seems to be, you know, you know, people get excited to actually go out and try new things and get out to see the city. I mean, I know I actually I do. What, what is your advice to get out and really explore you, Restaurant Week? Uh, book early. Uh, you know, there's about 300 restaurants that are that are participate within it approximately. And, of course, there's only so many of the prime slots that are available. You can always get in early or get in late. But Restaurant Week is great. It's great on many levels. It's great uh, for the consumer. It's great for the restaurateur. Although we're selling meals at, uh, under what we would normally do, it's giving us the ability to expose our business, our service, our style, our food, our experience to a much broader t- uh, range of people that one day may become regulars of our restaurants. Uh, and for the consumer, it's fantastic because the consumer gets to experience a, a whole host of restaurants that they maybe wouldn't have thought about going to or felt was out of their price range. Uh, and it just wins. Everybody wins on every single level. It's also great for a city like New York. Uh, they run theirs for quite a long time. It runs about three weeks. Uh, and uh, I do know that people that actually will plan to come to New York and restaurant week. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because we have such great restaurants here and such great service. That's be able to come here and know that you can go out and, and, and dine in with some of the greatest chefs in the world and some of the greatest restaurants in the world at 25 bucks for lunch or 38 42 dollars for dinner is fantastic and so what's next for the one group uh, we're going to carry on our expansion. We're gonna, as you mentioned earlier, we are going to operate, uh, open up to about 50 SDKs around the world. There'll only actually be about 12 or 14 here in America. Uh, but we also have created SDK Rebel. Uh, SDK Rebel is SDK, uh, except it just has a slightly uh, broader menu because it'll open for lunch as well as for dinner. Mm. Uh, and it's slightly more accessibly priced. SDK Rebel is a little bit more garage, it's a little bit more rock and roll, but it's still a stylized steakhouse. Uh, and it will really compete with the Ruth Chris or the Flemings or Sullivans. So we believe on that uh, product we could open maybe 100, 125 of those. So that's really a big part of our expansion, uh, both nationally and internationally. Are we going to see one of those here in New York? Uh, we are identifying sites in New York. Uh, I think New York will maybe take one or two of them. Uh, New Yorkers love SDK. Uh, it, SDK was founded here in the city, and it really was founded on what we understood New Yorkers like and enjoy. So so, you know, it's a really – it's dear to our heart, our operation here in the city. Uh, but certainly uh, we see situations where we could have an SDK and a Rebel in certain cities. But also Rebel can go to some of the outlying cities and go to Westchester and go to Greenwich, Connecticut. So we can move it into the, the, into the uh, 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 slightly out of the cities because the boxes are smaller. An SDK is about nine to 10,000 square feet. A Rebel is about 5,000 square feet. So it's a, it's a much more compressed SDK, still with the same vibe and energy, though. So I always say um, when I sit with somebody who's been an entrepreneur of the year, um, you know, often we run so fast that we forget our own successes. When you turn around and look back, what makes you smirk and smile? What are you most proud of? Uh, I, I think that well, it, it, from that particular award uh, was the fact that my father, uh, 15 years ago, was in the same competition in England <laughs> and he was only a finalist. <laughs> 
and it took me 35 years to beat my dad. Oh, so yeah. uh, I remind him every day that I can. When I, and I send him a photograph, and every now and again when I'm in trouble with him, I just send him a photograph of my award. Um, so, but I think, you know, I was asked the question, what makes an entrepreneur? And I think what makes an entrepreneur is the ability to see over the wall. I think we can mm -hmm. all see to the wall. Um, and I think the difference is who can see over the wall. And I, I, I read an interesting article uh, the other day, and somebody says, if you're going down the wrong road, eventually you have to turn back. And I sometimes think that's a differential with an entrepreneur because an entrepreneur won't necessarily turn back. They're just going to stubbornly keep going because they really believe in what they want to achieve. Uh, and so that's kind of how I see it. I love that. I think we're going to actually close with that because I like that being able to see over the wall. I think that that applies all the way across the board in life. And in so many aspects. So it's thank you so much for coming in. You're an absolute joy and pleasure. And My congratulations pleasure. on your success. Thank and, you so much. and thank you for giving me a place to go hang out because <laughs> I desperately needed one. That's our pleasure. So thank you so much. I, you can always find me Saturday Interesting Conversations because I'm Amelia, always here on 77 WABC.